Yeah, well done. OK, well, of course, that's the 125s down and out for another day and another classic battle of 500s to come. Practice has been interesting. There's been a number of crashes throughout practice. Let's update you on how the sessions went. The final qualifying session saw the big three out of Eastern Creek back at it again. Mick Doohan took some laps to get used to the humidity. The heated char alarm was on in more ways than one. Talking of number one, the world champion Wayne Rainey was quick early in the session. The track has not been a lucky one for the Californian. The sport's newest kid on the block, Daryl Beattie, settled into his rhythm quickly, reeling off lap after lap just a shade slower than Rainey and Doohan. All of this with that shadow of replacement hanging over the Australian shoulder. It appears no matter how well DB goes, a Japanese rider will get his seat. Doohan again won the psychological war, taking pole. I was lucky that Swans wasn't here too, I think, you know, Swans and Kaczynski. There's a few guys out, so we are fastest, but it's hard to, to say if I would have been, if everyone would have been here. But, you know, it's, it's hard to go fast out there, really. It's like the side grip's a big problem, I think, for everyone. And, um, you know, anything that's going to last a distance hasn't got any grip on its side, so it's hard to actually go fast here. You, you want to go a lot faster than you're allowed to, really. You know? Rainey seemed tentative after he stepped off the bike however, can never be discounted. You know, I think a bike can be a lot better than what it is right now. But, uh, you know, we're not that far off, according to the times. Beatty, well, all he can do is his best, and third in practice is pretty good. I'm surprised to be in third place, but, uh, you know, I, I don't really expect to be any higher up, but I, uh, I'd like my lap times to probably be a little bit better. But, uh, you know, I've got to settle for that. Kevin Swans fell down during last year's event and broke his wrist. This time round, it was his hand. Well, I, uh, I was on a fairly good lap. I was, my biggest concern was that I was taking the untimed practices a bit, uh, a bit cautious. I wasn't really riding the bike 100%, and I think that's what was causing us some of the problems in the races that we were having. Uh, a couple laps would be really hard, and then I was backing off and thinking, ah, oh, this is only untimed. Uh, anyway, I had a good lap going. I, um, one guy fell in front of me. It kind of distracted me from, from the corner that I was in, and then another guy, a corner worker, ran across the track in front of me. Uh, just the two distractions and a, and a little bit too much throttle in the wrong spot of the corner and uh, the bike just spun around. And that's a shame because it robs the race of uh, a lot of excitement. Well, Barry, there's the grids. Yeah, and Mick on pole position, second Rainey, third BT, fourth Greville. That's very good from Greville. Second round of the grid, Neil McKenzie, Doug Chandler, Randy Mamela and Juan Garriga. And the third row, Peter Goddard, good ride from him. Alex Barros, who fell down in, in the warm-up, but still going to be riding. Eddie Lawson and Miguel G. Hamill. And there we are, Daryl Beatty, the man with such a cloud over his uh, shoulders. Can you believe what's going to happen about this? Yeah. Again. <laughs> in a nutshell, because what you've got to bear in mind is that um, Daryl was signed up to do the uh, Japanese Championship, and uh, then he was drafted in when Wayne hurt himself. Um, the guy that was riding for Hondas in the Japanese Championship, a guy called e Ito, wasn't doing the business, got beaten by the Yamaha riders, so they said, well, we need Beatty. So the answer is they're going to take Beatty back to Japan, with his infamous team manager, and um, send Ito, who has no chance of even getting in the first six, over to do the Grand Prix, which is a complete and utter waste of time and just absolutely endorses what I think about the way they run it. I think you made that pretty clear in Japan. Funny you should say that, Tessa. <laughs> well, there's the grid now. As we've said, you can see the umbrellas out and uh, just noticing a lot of locals have got newspapers over their heads and their wet towels on their faces. So uh, we talked about the humidity and the heat. It's obviously still there. Uh, if the locals are feeling it, the riders are certainly going to feel it. Oh, yeah, it's, it's very, very hot at this place. It's hot and really sticky. You can uh, go in the hotel, have a shower, walk to a car 20 feet, and you can be soaking wet again. I mean, it is purgatory to race there. Wayne Rainey. I mean, he's shadowed Mick at uh, Eastern Creek, fell down in Japan, and has shadowed him again. He's not happy with the bike. That's pretty obvious. Yeah. It's, it's quite funny, at this circuit, uh, Yamaha should really be in the pound seats because they did a lot of their testing there, Kaczynski and Rainey, and if um, anybody's got the place sussed, it should have been Yamaha's and Suzuki's. Suzuki's did all their testing there. But um, with, uh, with our boys, you know, the Honda guys, they, they haven't been there. 
um, since the Grand Prix last year and they've gone out and um, got everything dialed in pretty quickly. I was talking to Mick uh, earlier on this morning and he was saying that the big battle is choosing, choosing the right tyres because you go out on something that gives you the right grip but after sort of half the race distance it's going to be finished and you go out with something that will do the race distance but it doesn't grip as much. So it's, um, you know, it's something uh, as a bit of a sort of a compromise. Of course you're seeing this exclusively on Nine Sports, live from Malaysia. Wayne Rainey would have to have it in the back of his head, he broke his leg here, I mean that's got to haunt you somewhere around the circuit. Well it, it's, it's not going to be too bad for him because when he did break his leg he ran wide overtaking somebody, got on um, some mucky stuff and sort of gave it a handful and he realised why he fell down, you know it wasn't a sort of a oh dear why did that happen, so psychologically I don't think he'll be struggling with any kind of battle with it. Mick, they're interesting talking about that side grip again. He was saying that you feel like you can go a lot faster than you can. Yeah, well, this is it. With the You're having to run a tyre that is so hard to do the distance that it just doesn't have the grip. You could, you could run one that grip like what's it to a blanket sort of thing, but, you know, after six or seven laps, it's gone. Well, of course, he made the right choice at Eastern Creek in a, in a bold move that didn't really come into play halfway through the race. Well, really, you know, it uh, had us all a bit worried there at the beginning, but it was certainly the right, uh, the right choice. It was a complete punt on, uh, well, a sort of an educated punt on Mick's behalf, and uh, that's what racing's all about. So I'd, I'd imagine Daryl Beattie now would just want to go out and consolidate his third place if that's at all possible and better if he can of course just to throw one back at the Japanese. Well yeah I, was, I spoke to Daryl this morning and I, you know he's he was fully expecting it after as I said it all all relied on how well Ito did in Japan and the, an the answer was that he didn't do very well so they've got somebody in there that can do the job. Well here we go 34 laps 3.505 kilometres, race distance 119.17 kilometres. Very, very hot and humid, our information, and you can see it's almost like that oppressive air hanging over the circuit. Yeah, it's got that sort of dusty, oh, as Barros there is riding, uh, that sort of dust haze look about it. And Malaysia is, seems to be very, very grey, and when it gets to the afternoon, it really gets grey, and it seems the heat goes up, and um, nine cases out of ten at this sort of time of year, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, it uh, actually rains. Barros uh, dropped the bike in the uh, early session this morning? Yeah, he did. Uh, he didn't hurt himself. Uh, he just took some skin off here and there. The surprise to me is the fact that Suzuki have totally lost the plot as far as their chassis is concerned, in that it's doing exactly the same this year as it was last year. Um, in the middle of the corner, the bike wanders all over the show, and they just really have got it wrong so you know i can't you can't uh, hope to see too much from suzuki this year that's my opinion rotten luck for swans to break his wrist here last year and now yeah. to do a, a, the injury that he's done again apparently it's quite nasty the dislocation that's that's it you know and you're making up for sort of the bike's inadequacies and it has to bite you at the end of the day regardless if someone took his concentration if you're trying to get uh, a call out of a sort of a a pint bottle, it's a struggle. Mind you, we've seen Wayne Gardner over the years have exactly the same handful with his Honda. Yeah. Talking about Hondas, on the left-hand side of the front row there, that's Alex Creville. It's, he's amazed me with the 500 because he was very good on a 125, could not stay upright on a 250, and has done extremely well on the 500. But, uh, in Eastern Creek, he had a good ride. In Japan, he was riding really well all through practice. Now, let's hope this idiot with a starter bloke doesn't muck around peter galvin was saying that they kept him waiting so long now all the guys are there the blokes right they, at least they got their act together now so a green flag comes around here peter galvin phoned in too great to see uh, the youngsters looking after us here in australia race start now doing out of the blocks pretty quickly and in behind him is rainy and Creville also made a good start yeah, and also Beatty as well. That's a bit of a tight squid. That's Creville right up there behind Mick, Rainey, Dazzle, and Neil McKenzie, Daryl Beatty and Neil McKenzie. So Mick getting off the line for a change quickly. It saves you an awful lot of work, you know, around a place like this, if you can get clear at the beginning and you don't have to fight with people. It's, uh, it saves you a hell of a lot of work.
And look at the size of the field too as they stream through. That's going to come into play a little later on. We've spoken about now that the slower riders as such are on bikes that just are quick down the main stroke these days. Yeah, the slow riders here weren't as far off the pace as they have been. They're only sort of three or four seconds. So with any kind of luck, it will take a little bit. Oh, Chandler, terrible start for Chandler. He's in sort of 10th or 12th place. So that really is the end of the day for him. You know, he's been suffering with bike problems and that. And to get stuck behind here, it's really the finish of it. But Mick Doohan picking up where he left off at Eastern Creek and Japan. Out in front of the moment, Creville is in second place. In third place is Wayne Rainey. Then we have Darrell Beatty. Mackenzie is next. And I think that was uh, Randy Mamola. Yes, you're right. It's Mamola and uh, Gariga. Gariga first, Mamola. So Doohan flashes across the start-finish line at the end of lap one. And he's looking pretty good at the moment. In actual fact, that was Barros, not the moment. Yeah, it's uh, the first two or three laps around here, he would have plumped for the softest tyre possible to do the distance. Uh, he'll just be going sort of, you see there, he picked the bike up a little bit before he uh, got on the power, because he was saying, sight, see if we get a shot, as he comes out and he really starts to put the power on, he's trying to get the bike up as straight as he can before he puts the power on, because with the harder compound tyres, you don't have anywhere near as much grip on the, um, on the sides. A little bit of a hippie hippie shake there, but he seems to have enormous speed out of the course, doesn't he? Yeah, it's got uh, the Honda engine this year is certainly a lot better than it was last year, in that it's a lot more user friendly. It was very peaky, the power. And that means that it's just sort of like driving your car along in third gear and then it's got no power. You put your foot flat on the floorboards and then you change down into second and it takes off like a rat up a drain pipe. And that's the same as the Honda power last year. Whereas now they've, they've got the engine power good. So it's a nice, e easier to ride. They come out of the corner and it, the power comes in earlier and it's a much smoother spread of power. Rainey's starting to put a little bit more pressure on now at Graville. Laney in third, bike number one. 28 is Graville. Two, of course, is Mick Doohan. The last thing that Rainey wants is to have to um, sort of sit behind Creville. He'll be wanting, uh, obviously, to get past Creville as quick as he can because uh, all it will do for Mick is make life easier for him. If Creville can hold um, uh, Rainey up, then it's uh, doing Mick an enormous favour. I can't believe how good Creville's going, exceptionally. This is the first place he ever, ever sat on a 500. Uh, the last Grand Prix last year, um, when Cito Pons decided to retire, this is where Creville tested Pons' bike to see how he went on the 500. So he does know the circuit. I noticed too that Darrell Beatty having a good look where Mackenzie was. He's right behind him. Yeah, Darrell's uh, lost a little bit of contact there, and I can't see that he will be able to make up uh, that amount of ground because if he, was, if he was able to go that quick, he would still be with his leading three. You saw there just uh, half, half, and, half in and half out the shot. Rainey's bike shaking all over the show. He's really unhappy with the, uh, with the way it's been handling. Last year he was so pleased with it, you know, he said it felt part of him. But this year they really have uh, suffered some pretty bad problems. It's almost like you've swapped the bikes yeah, exactly. around, isn't it? I mean, that's exactly the same problem that the Honda riders had for the last two seasons. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's taken Honda an awful lot of hard work to get it right. But now if you watch the bike, overall, it's performing really well. You know, with the engine power, suits the, uh, the characteristics of the engine, suit the frame. And Rainey's not having it easy at the moment, that's for sure. Fastest man on the circuit at the moment, Creville, se second place at the moment, but certainly closing right up on Mick and turning in the fastest lap. Yeah, well, the Spaniards uh, watching this live, and they will be doing backflips because uh, to get somebody that goes good in the 500 class, um, it will please them no end. And he's certainly doing a good job at the moment. <laughs> it's definitely something that Mick doesn't need, but um, it's fair in love and war, isn't it? Mick Dozy's there, there's no doubt about that. See Ramey now putting on the pressure because he's, he's got to get past Graville and stay with Mick. It's see, easier said than done. Oh yeah, see, the Honda really does look good now. It's, uh, 
looks like a good package at last. So these three now, Dewan, Gravel and Rainey, certainly opening up a buffer gap. They're, they're opening up ever so slightly, but each time round that gap's getting wider and wider. I think the only thing that lets uh, Creville down is possibly his stamina, because he hasn't been at um, the front of a 500 battle. He's ridden in a couple of 500 races, but he hasn't been in the heat, heat of uh, the battle for 30 laps, 28 or whatever it is, laps. So I think you'll find after four or five laps, then Rainey will get past him. And uh, you see the back end of Creville's bike there, we'll spin I've had lots of mail and phone calls this week with people watching motorcycle racing for the first time at Eastern Creek. Of course, we go all around Australia through New Zealand. And they, they're quite, they can't understand why the bike is leaping up in the air quite so much. Well, the front end, front wheel. Well, when you come out, you imagine with a 500, they weigh around 130 kilos and you've got 170 brake horsepower. So when you, when you tread on the power, well, when you give it some stick coming out of a corner, what it's trying to do is basically trying to throw you off the back of it all the time. The same way as soon as when you get on the brakes at the end of the straight, it's trying to pitch you over the handlebars. But the Honda looks like it's got a good balance this year because it's not um, it's not stuck to the ground on the front in that uh, it changes direction nicely. It doesn't wheelie an awful lot. The front wheel doesn't come up an awful lot. On braking, it looks pretty stable. So overall, uh, chassis-wise, they definitely Creville is definitely struggling now. You see the back end of Creville's bike coming on to start and finish there. Well, of course, the two races being this time of the day are bonus for uh, motorcycle lovers and perhaps new people to the sport because normally the races are coming in uh, in the later hours of uh, the night or early hours of the morning. So we're getting a lot of interest now for people who sat down and watched for the first time. To see Mick, he's just pulling out a little bit of ground there. Now we're going to see if Rainey has. Oh, that where it, Mick was getting on the power. There, you see, that was the left hand side of the tyre, and then the right hand side of the tyre. So, tyres are really going to play a big, big part in this. And uh, he just put the power on, and it started to spin and come round a little bit. You back it off, or if you can keep the power on, but he had to change direction there, so he had to back it off. So now Rainey has gone past Creville. Will he hold him out? Yes, he does. So he gets into second place. We said last weekend the amount of battles that Dewan and Rainey have had over the past two seasons. This is just another one. Yeah, it's, um, well, it's nice if you end up racing regularly with a guy because you get to know exactly what they do, exactly how trustworthy they are on the circuit. And uh, basically, when you're racing like this, it's your life in their hands, really. If you're um, racing with a guy that is a notorious fruitcake, then it frightens the life out of you. You know, you're doing 170 mile an hour, and you're sort of half an inch away from somebody. Lap seven, they're on now. And the Australian getting a, a rousing reception. We saw just prior to crossing to the race start, there's uh, a lot of Australian flags flying. There's a lot of people working and living in the uh, area now. So a lot of support there for doing. Yeah, plus the fact, um, you hear, you can hear the wheel spinning there on Dunes Bryant. Plus the fact a company organised a tour up to Malaysia, so there'd be quite a few of our lot up there. And Mick really trying at the moment. Yeah, it's, you have to be so careful with uh, when when you know you've got tyre problems like this, where the tyre may not last, well, it's definitely going to last, but you, they're using such a hard one that you can't rely on it coming out of a corner. You get on the power, you're pushing it as hard as you can to the limit where we saw Mick earlier on just get it sideways a bit. That's what you have to do. That means you're getting the best out of the tyre and a little bit beyond it. Well, Gravel hanging on really well. And when you look at the gap back now to uh, fourth, fifth and sixth, gee whiz, they're opening up quite a gap so early in the race. Yeah, it's funny how um, they just absolutely done a run it there's no doubt about that i'm really impressed with Creville. that's the Creville. it's really surprising because it doesn't matter if he did ride a bike at 500 for the first time on this circuit you've still got to be good you don't end up up there out of sheer luck or having a good bike or whatever you have to ride it hard well one of the big disappointments uh, disappointments for you was cedo ponds yeah ponds was started to go really well 
and then uh, Roney quickest slap. Pons was going really well, and then he uh, Kili crashed in front of him in Yugoslavia, and he just totally destroyed his confidence. After that, um, it was all downhill from there on. He never ever um, became the the good rider he used to be. He was just frightened of the 500. So there's the gap back, and of course we can see that for ourselves. So Rainey now, you think he'll make the charge now, or would he rather just hang in there for a little while longer? Well, he won't want to live. That's not too bad a gap. You see, that's quite livable with. Uh, he won't want to drop back too much further than that. I wouldn't mind betting. He'll just sort of stay in that position and just look how mixed tyres are going, because when, when an if mix starts to slide around on the back end, uh, that would be the time to put the pressure on because you know he's got nothing left to respond with. So the roles have been reversed from Eastern yeah, Creek? exactly. That's the, that's the, one of the enjoyable things about racing. You're riding around um, and you're concentrating on what you're doing, obviously. But at the same time, Rainey, not, not so much Mick at the moment, because he's out front, but Rainey would be working it out and thinking, well, He's quick there, he's slow there, or whatever, and it looks as if the back end's starting to wriggle around. That's uh, Daryl and uh, Neil McKenzie. Great dice between these two. That's been on since they, they, they uh, started. Yeah, it's fourth and fifth. Fourth and fifth, and I think Lawson's getting right up there. I say I think, because you're only seeing as much of this as we are. So the gap remains much the same. Rainey sitting in behind Doohan. Doohan, of course, won in Japan. He just smashed the opposition over there in the rain. He saw the fantastic race at Eastern Creek just a week ago. And here they are for round three. Leading the championship, of course, is McDoohan. And a win here today would be very, very handy. And here's the man we all feel sorry for, Darrell Beattie, in fourth at the moment. McKenzie in behind him. And he is going to lose that ride and have to be forced to go back to Japan. We'll hear a lot more about that before the move happens. We'll be back shortly with more of the action. Welcome wherever you're watching in Australia. Just watching Mackenzie taking Daryl Beatty. So it's now doing Rainey Creville, Mackenzie, Beatty and Barros. They're the top players for you. And these two have been hard at it since the race started. Mackenzie just getting the better of Daryl Beatty there. Yeah, it's good for Daryl to have somebody to race with because when you're in temperatures like this and you get get the situation where you're sort of six seconds behind, eight seconds in front, it gets you back into mixed bikes sliding around all over the show. It gets very, very lonely and all you think about is how long is this race going to go on? I'm so hot. You talk about long races and I was just saying to you uh, in that commercial break that 34 laps was a long race and you were saying that uh, back in 81 it was a lot longer and you lost an incredible amount of body weight. Oh, yeah, it was 40... Oh, hard work mixing. Yeah, it was 45 laps in 81 and I was racing uh, with Mamala and after the race I'd lost seven and a quarter kilos. Yeah, hard to comprehend, isn't it? So uh, we talk about the humidity. It, it's got to come into play, but they, I mean, nobody is, is fitter than Mick Doohan. I think Creville had a bit of a moment there, and you see how much, see how much rain he's got on him all in half a lap. Uh, it's so easy to do, just um, get, get a big sideways. Uh, so I think you'll find now that Mick and Rainey will do a runner and leave Creville to his own devices, which would be really bad for Creville, because you'll probably find that with his, st with his stamina going down, or the lack of stamina rather, um, he'll get so worried about how long the race is etc etc or I feel tired then he'll probably start dropping back and could drop back as far um, so that uh, Mackenzie and uh, Beatty can get him. On lap 13 now I just made the comment about how fit Mick is he's superbly trained. Oh yeah he's worked uh, really very very hard at being fit when he first started doing 500 Grand Prix it surprised him a bit um, how fit he had to be so he really got his finger out the second season and he's been incredibly fit since then. He goes running and gym and this, that and the other. And you get out of your sport what you put into it, don't you, really? This man looking threatening now. Yeah, Mick certainly hasn't dropped him off. It's interesting, when, when we come to one of, the, uh, one of the acceleration sections, I'll shut up and you listen, see if you can hear the wheels spinning. 
Oh, this is the uh, back market group there. That's uh, Corrado and Kevin Mitchell and Serge David. One of the one of the sections where they're close up on on Nick or Rainey. You can really hear the words. Not too much. Out, but I'll tell you when we come to it. I think it's this section of the list. You can just hear the note, you hear the, the engine note, and that little r at the end of it is the wheel starting to spin. And it's just very difficult when you're you're riding one of these things. You have to you have to ride it until the uh, uh, the wheel, rear wheel starts to lose traction, and then sort of ease it maybe a fraction, or just keep it on depending on what kind of corner. So, really, you're running on sort of a knife edge. That's Gariga, Barros, and still get the old brand of Barros. It's interesting there watching uh, Barros's bike. He's on Dunlop tyres, as is Lawson. And the back end of Barros's bike, although we only got one shot of it, it looked nice and uh, steady. Yeah. That's exactly what I was talking about there. It's like sound effects, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I might just turn it down like you do. <laughs> Mackenzie getting a little gap now on Daryl Beattie. Yeah, I think that uh, Daryl was saying uh, this morning that in practice, he kind of lost, lost the plot. Uh, they were testing suspension tires trying to get the gearbox right etc 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 having a go at everything all at once and having not ridden there before trying to learn the circuit so that uh, you put a gearbox in that suits you when you first go out but as sure as eggs are eggs as soon as you start going quicker then you need to change the gearbox ratios to suit you and when you have all that to do plus sort it plus try and get a good practice time plus sort out the right tire he said we well, got the hell of a state and um maybe they've just um chosen the wrong tire or something you know really something we won't know until it's all over so wayne rainey the car world champion of course dropped the bike in the wet in japan finished second to mcdoon at eastern creek and now in the same position at the moment at charlotte chasing this man mcdoon the queenslander leading the championship has led all the races and won the races so far, Japan and Eastern Creek in front here. And if anything, he's probably just opened that gap slightly. Yeah, he's definitely turned the wick up now. And so he'll have a go, good, hard go for a couple of laps. Uh, oh, that means oil on the track, that um, yellow and orange flag. So somebody must have fallen down somewhere. Psychologically, though, Barry, from the from the uh, season start of the opening race, he really has dominated the practice sessions. If Rainey's gone out and gone quicker, he's come back and answered that challenge. So he's been in front of the psychological war from the word go. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about that. But the, just having a little go and getting a rip-off off, or either that or pointing with something or other. You see he took his left hand off the handbar. Um, yeah, he's psychologically, he's really strong. But the only problem is with winning all the time, then it gets a little you win say three or four grand prix or six or seven grand prix on the trot then if somebody is all of a sudden quicker than you in practice and beats you in the race it comes as a bit of a shock and then you have to sort of catch up with it all again and it takes you sort of a race to get over it i don't mean you know being temperamental or anything you know to sort of gear yourself up to go as quick as the guy that beat you Chandler's a disappointment this race. He was so good at Eastern Creek, so incredibly good in the wet in Japan. Yeah, and in all the testing, you know, I, I, what it is, it's the bike. That's all there is to it. You know, Suzuki has lost the plot uh, as far as getting their bike sorted out so it handles. And it's not a good package. Four or five years ago, it was the best package. But um, they really have got to uh, do a lot of work because... Chandler showed how good he is. We all know how good um, Schwantz is, and the bike just really isn't performing the way it should do. Chandler up into sixth spot, but Rainey closing back on McDoon again. Yeah, I don't think you'll find he's going to. If Mick 
pulled out that amount of ground and Rainey's pulled it, but oh, that's a rip off Mick just or a tear off, whatever you like to call it. Uh, Mick just threw off there. Yeah, if, if Rainey's closed up that easily, that quickly, then it's not going to be an easy job for Mick. It's going to be a hard one all right the way to the end. A lot of movement then coming into that corner from Mick's bike. Yeah, it's just the back end of the, uh, you see there, but just a little bit of a slide just before he changed his direction. And uh, it's, you have to really, you have to be so on the ball to catch it. You can hear him there spinning. They know each other so well, these two now, don't they? Oh, yeah, it's, it's great to ride with someone that uh, you do know well, um, because it's uh, coming up on, who's that? It's, I think Catalano or Schmashman. Yeah, it's good when you get to know somebody really well, having raced with them a lot. See his day is with a back marker, so I'm not sure, right? Yeah, which just you uh, get to know somebody really well and you can trust them, and that was smashed when they passed. You can trust them because you know what they're going to do, they're not going to do anything silly, and uh, it just takes a big weight off your mind. Dewan got the run with the traffic at Eastern Creek. It went against him the year before, but he certainly got the, a dream run last week. And today, by the looks of it, because uh, that certainly didn't do a rainy any favours. So as they go across the start line now, Chandler is up into fifth place, and the BD is dropping back. We'll take a break, be back shortly to Sharalam in Malaysia. Well, welcome back. As Barry Sheen predicted at the start of this race, rain has started to fall. Rainey has called it off. He's waving everybody down and saying, slow down, the rain's starting to tumble down. And Barry, you said it gets so grey and normally rains in the afternoon. Spot yeah. on. It does, you know, I've been there and suffered from it. And uh, the great thing is now, this is where Bernie, Ac uh, Bernie Eccleston's new regulations come into being, in that uh, they have to restart within half an hour, where, and they don't stop the race anymore. For example, if it stops raining now, you can see it's really coming down quite hard. Um, they've got to make their decision, OK, we put wets on, we put intermediates on, I go out on slicks, but whatever bed you make you lie in it you know you can't they can't go out on slicks and then have the race stopped again that's the end of the story so uh -huh. that's got all that total stupidity and confusion out the way what uh, what happens now is going to be the person that wants to take the biggest punt you know because what it can do it can pour down for um 10 minutes and then because of the uh, temperature of the ground it will dry out very quickly so you could say right okay i'll go for an intermediate tire which is just a lightly cut tire or you can say right i'll um i'll take a chance it's going to pour with rain and just stick wets on it shades of surface paradise uh, for the indy car exactly. race i mean exactly the same exactly thing the same thing you know there's uh, it's it's so nice that they've got the regulations sorted out now because everybody knows what's going on it's not a case of um, a bright team manager, in the case of um, Roberts's team manager guy, um, Butler, used to go up there and lobby to the um, clerk of the course who's in charge of the race and say, oh, well, maybe we should delay for another this or another that. So now it's, it's written, clearly written, and there will be no... <laughs> and by the look of the way it's Randy, they're giving his barnet a wash. Um, it's just... There's no decision to be made, so you can see, you or I, or anybody sitting at home can see what tyres you need on for that. And they will just wait until um, they get within 10 minutes of the time they have to start and say, OK, we're going to put um, whatever tyres, you know, they made up their mind on. Well, you can see how hot they were in those leathers because Randy had no, no hesitation pulling down and getting wet. I mean, he was obviously very hot. Oh, you do. You just get so really terribly hot and the thing that gets on your nerves is inside the helmet unless you wear a sweat band uh, i could never ever wear one of those things the sweat used to run down my forehead run into my eyes and it burns your eyes so badly so you end up the race um you know looking like you've had a really hard night the night before it's uh, it's a really horrible thing well disappointing for the big crowd there too i mean they've turned out in their hundreds of thousands for this race but it could be uh, a very very interesting second half now Oh uh, yeah, for sure. It's uh, we know how good Mick goes in the rain. We know how good Rainey goes in the rain. We know how good Creville goes in the rain. And um, 
the nice thing about the fact that it is really pouring down is that there's no there's no sort of decisions to be made on tyres. It's wet tyres, that's the end of the story. Well, that sky does look pretty heavy, doesn't it? So there we are. You can see the rain tumbling down. The umbrellas are up. But, of course, the race will continue in the time allotted. We'll be back with all of the action. Stay with us, Australia. This will be a beauty, the second half of this one. Welcome back. Nice to have you company right around Australia. Well, it's absolutely buckling down in Malaysia. The race will continue, of course. The garage doors are down and the uh, wet weather tyres are being fitted and the race will recommence uh, at the allotted time, which is a half an hour from the time the race was stopped. So plenty of action to come. But one of the men that uh, really captured our imaginations, I guess, at Eastern Creek was John Surtees. He brought the MV Augusta out to Australia, the bike that he had so much uh, success on. And the sound of this machine was just quite incredible. It was the talking point around the circuit for most of the day after he had his run. And believe you me, old John really gave it the business too. He was getting around the circuit in quite some time. And when you consider... Uh, just what this man's achieved both on two and four wheels. His exploits of the Isle of Man were there legendary and his drive with Ferrari equally as le uh, legendary. Well, I had the chance to catch up to him just prior to Eastern Creek. We thought we'd give you another look at John Suttees. We had so much comment after what he had to say about the 500 runners today and the English problem that they have trying to find a competitive rider. Here he is, the man, the only man to have won the championship on both four wheels and two wheels. John Surtees, one of a kind, world Formula One driving champion, world motorcycling champion. The only man to achieve this magnificent double crown. How does the great man look at today's Grand Prix bike stars? Do they just do it for money? The Japanese Grand Prix of last weekend uh, showed how much heart they have got because when you see the drives like or rides like Gardner did uh, of course I mean only this can only come from the heart you know you need a big heart for that which is, is super I think one of the problems is that it is so commercialized and it needs to be commercialized I mean frankly to be efficient and to exist in this day and age it needs to be commercialized but so many of the fringe activities around it uh, the sort of journalists and such like uh, don't bother to sort of get through and show that these people started off and initially rode bikes and they just loved riding them. The 500 machines that are brutally powerful. Quick, aren't they? Uh, I mean, enormously powerful. I mean, there's something which uh, real projectiles. Uh, I obviously didn't sort of have to cope with any sort of power like they have today, although we did do it on sort of tires which are probably three and a half inches wide. But then comparisons between riders of a period or machines of a period and another period are, are quite uh, useless. Uh, you need to go along this purely judge people on the period when they actually race themselves. I think today's machines are, you know, very exciting. The only thing um, which isn't quite as exciting is the sort of sound they make. Yes. You know, uh, one of the things I think which has been sadly missing from Brother Cycling has been the sounds of, shall we say, the good old four stroke. Yes. Uh, two strokes may be highly efficient, but they haven't got that uh, sort of that wonderful, note. wonderful note. Riders like yourself and Mike Halewood and the other greats all went to the Isle of Man. We don't see the modern day races there. I can quite understand uh, the Rainies and uh, the Lawsons and the rest not going along. Remember, you used to go there and you used to spend two weeks doing practice and doing the race. And, in fact, to have any chance, you had to sort of go there two or three months beforehand also, uh, the first time at least. It's an enormous amount out of a season, and today's racing is so very different. I loved my period uh, on the short circuits of England, round the Brands Hatch, but also in the Isle of Man. But I had this greater affection for superb sweeps and turns of places like Spa, where we had lots of fast corners. I am sorry to see modern circuits develop to where they all stop and start. 
But the fact that they're developing that way means that the machines in turn uh, have also gone that way. So they're no longer the machines that are suitable for circuits like the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man is a very special memory and something which could be kept alive, but I don't think with modern Grand Prix machinery. I mean, I don't think people understood that the sort of dangers you faced. Did you understand those dangers in those days? You obviously uh, understood that uh, if you came off and you hit something, uh, it could be very uncomfortable. You could, you could hurt yourself, in fact. But I uh, would raise another question. I think I would have rather have taken the dangers of the Island Man and the possibility that I might hit a telegraph post or uh, the odd cow, as I did in fact one morning practice, mm. uh, against the certainty of ending up with a guardrail. And for a period, racing was even more dangerous, I think, when circuits suddenly sprouted on the uh, request of the car people, guardrails everywhere. I think that was the most dangerous period. Barry Sheen was the last Brit to take the title. Sir Tees has a strong viewpoint of the reasons why. Yes, I think they become champions too quickly. I think one of the problems is that we have a vast number of circuits, super circuits, all within a relatively small area, i.e. England's a small country. And so they have a tremendous opportunity to do, get a lot of racing in. But you've got as soon as someone wins a uh, teens race or something else, suddenly he's a champion. And in turn, you've had manufacturers give a little support and they're paid quite reasonable money and they sort of uh, go along and, oh, yes, he's good, he's this and that. And I think, frankly, um, part of the English disease has been the problem, i.e. they've become satisfied too early. Well, there we are, live pitchers back from Malaysia. They're going out to reform the grid. Barry, you have said very similar things to John Surtees. He's I, gee, I was impressed with him. He's a lovely man. I met him in Adelaide a few years ago and he bought that wonderful old Mercedes out. But he does make a lot of sense. Oh, he does. You know, there's no doubt about it. In England, uh, um, the reason there's no new talent, if you like, in, in my days and, the, you know, the, the likes of my sort of days, there were people that uh, you'd stick your bike in the back of a van and you'd drive, you know, overnight and you'd race and you'd drive straight back and then you'd start work at six in the morning. And much the same as it is in Australia and that's why Australia's producing the talent. England, I mean, somebody goes to some obscure club race somewhere and finishes in fifth position, and then gets onto their local Ford dealer and wants a truck out of them. Say, well, what are you doing? Oh, well, I finished fifth, you know, and... Uh, and um, you know, they, they all like the lifestyle of, of racing champions, etc., etc. The thing that they're missing is 15 years' hard work. Yeah, so John Surtees, if you didn't get the chance to see that wonderful machine, you can see the water being brushed off the circuit here at Shah Alam. Uh, it was something else to hear that bike uh, around Eastern Creek. Beautiful. Hey, fantastic old thing. And uh, they saved all, all the uh, Envy Augustas, the 250ccs, 125s, 500s and that. And um, when you see they have like an Envy Augusta day, and you hear all that lot going, better still, in the days when the multi-cylinder four-strokes used to race, at a Grand Prix, you get five-cylinder 125ccs and that. You just could not imagine the noise. Incredible. So here we are now. You can have a look coming back live to uh, Shah Alam, the water being brushed off in uh, the areas that's going to upset the, the riders the most. And Barry, the rain has definitely eased. It was buckling down before. So now, what do we do with choice of tyres? Well, this is where um, it comes down, 18 minutes remaining. You see, it's so good now, Daryl, that we... Act oh, sorry, no, there's 18 minutes. <laughs> I was thinking that they were having a countdown with the, with, uh, the minutes, because as far as I know, I'm sh pretty sure it's 30 minutes. So you get a countdown how long you've got. Everybody knows exactly where they stand. And um, what you would have to do is leave it until the last possible sort of moment to make your choice in, with tyres, for sure it's um, not going to be slick tyres, slow, well, no, certainly not on the front. You could get somebody that takes an out and out punt and goes for a slick slick on the uh, rear and a cut tyre on the front, but as it stands, 
If I, if I was Mick, I would plump for what Rainey has on. Because it, in a situation like this, you can outsmart yourself through trying to be clever. So if you go for what Rainey's got on, he's the only guy that Mick should be worried about and will be worried about. We'll be as slick as we can with this break <laughs> back shortly. Welcome back. Live pictures from Shale Arm. You can see the frantic work going on the garages now. Where they're working out just what sort of rubber they're going to put on. The race, we're told, will commence in around about uh, six, seven minutes' time. But in the meantime, one of the great characters that came out of New Zealand, as far as a racer goes, was Graham Crosby. Now, Graham Crosby didn't win what was then known as the World Championship. He had a lot of success on the Superbikes, and Barry was in a, a member of a team with you at one stage. Yeah, he was. Um, I rode in the Yamaha team with him, and uh, when I left Suzuki, he took my position at Suzuki. Well, you're going to enjoy this. There's a great <laughs> ending to this story. We went to Auckland uh, a year or so ago, and we, we sat down and talked to Graham Crosby about his likes and dislikes and what he thought about the sport today. He is a great character. He, he really did pioneer a lot of the things from Australasia. Let's meet the man now, Graham Crosby. In the late 70s, a brash, fun-loving Kiwi, Graham Crosby, was making his presence felt around the European racetracks. Crosby had made the trip to the big time via Australia, where the likeable New Zealander had built up a reputation as a hard charger, or to some, a wild boy. You've, you've given this image that you're a bit like the sort of image that Howard projects, that he's always got time for a beer and that it's not really that serious anyway. And what is you, the time? <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you just get on the bike and ride it, and if you win, you win. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Do, is that true, or are you really basically a very serious thinking person? Well, being in England, the pubs aren't open at this time. It's a bit of a problem. Um, yes, yes, I try to be like that, because if I try and get... You know, there's two distinct styles, we'll say, with, with present world champion Kenny Robertson, ex-world champion Barry Sheen. One comes into a corner real fast and gets out of it slightly slow, and the other one comes into a corner slow but puts the power on a lot earlier to get out. And this is Cross's way. Cross comes into the corner slower and likes to open the throttle and for it to drive. That drive these days centres around his successful dealership in Auckland. Crosby is still very much a hands-on operator. Well, Gordon, now that you've decided this is your bike, you better come over to the sales area, mate, and I'll relieve you of your wallet. I'll hold you up by the ankles and shake you and see what you're worth. <laughs> Motorcycles have always played a major role in Crosby's life. From the moment he could walk, he was taught to ride. God, that was back in the days when, you know, like they invented the wheel. They had a pair of them, right? Um, this was years and years ago, obviously. Uh, a friend of mine had a BSA Bantam, which is a, you know, real old, old croucher. And um, he just let me have a ride sitting on the tank, a bit like, you know, just a kid sitting on it, having a bit of a go. And that sort of got me a bit encouraged to sort of uh, have a bit of a, a play with him at that stage. How old were you then? Oh, about 11, I guess. So was there any interest in competing then, or was it just something to play with? Something to play with and take my hand off other things. <laughs> <laughs> that motorised play thing became a working tool that saw Crosby sweep all before him in New Zealand and then take on the Australian circuit. When I got there, it was really strange because I'd virtually won everything in New Zealand and to go across and just to get a ride in the six-hour race was like a... it was really hard work. I mean, I had to, you know, on the soles of my feet, sort of walking around asking to get a ride and. You know, Kawasaki sort of turned their nose up at me and said, no, 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 I don't think so. No, we're looking for somebody with a bit of uh, experience and stuff like that. I eventually got a, a ride on a, on a Z, I think it was a Z900 for the Kawasaki, uh, for the Castrol 6 hour race over there, that in a straight line it left two tyre tracks. You know, it was like, <laughs> it was pretty well bent. And um, I know the, the valve gear was all broken because it was sort of put together out of parts from a speedway bike. And it was really a, an old croucher thrown together. And I think we finished about fourth or fifth there, or whatever it was, and Kawasaki saw it, hey, that's pretty good. It was good enough to move to Europe, and the larrikin in Crosby was evident from the time he arrived in France. And we used UTA French Airlines for that, we arrived, the bike didn't. <laughs> well, we actually, we got it out of um, the Charles de Gaulle Airport on the Friday, the race, the 24-hour race started on the following day on the Saturday, 
and we had to ride this big super bike with slick tyres through the, through the Arc de Triomphe, down these cobble streets and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely, you know, absolutely raining, and there I am, no, no jackets, no nothing, and I'm sort of hooking into it. And we rode all the way down these, um, the big motorways in, in France, and we finally got there, and the thing seized, and, you know, I saw this big sign that said, uh, it showed a picture of Phil Reed, I think it was, Elf petrol and I always thought Phil Reed elf petrol must be good stuff so he stuck this stuff in and you could put it on your hand and it just wouldn't even evaporate for a day you know so you can imagine what happened when we put this thing into this into this bike every time it had turned you know 10 yards it had seize all the time the famous Isle of Man races are still some of Graham Crosby's favorite motorsport memories this historic track was a happy hunting ground for the tough Kiwi Everybody's got their own opinions of the TT. Mine, personally, is the fact, yes, you can learn the TT. It's not a, it's not a hard circuit to learn. And the reason is that um, all the corners are different, and everything becomes sections. You know, you, you arrive from a very fast high speed through this, uh, you know, the trees growing over, through a windy, twisty thing in top gear, you know, absolutely, you know, 150 mile an hour. Um, and you arrive, the next, at the end of that straight, there's a, there's a bridge that has to be taken at, I don't know, 20k or 30k, and you leap 10 feet in the air. I mean, it's not hard to learn after you've been around once that you've got to look forward to the end of that straight because something's coming up. And then you go through, like that particular the Black Bridge, uh, you go out of there, you go onto the next section, and that next section might be eight miles. But because it's so different than the, the miles before, it's, it's just so easy to learn. The British Grand Prix saw our own Barry Sheen figure in an incident with Cros. Graham picks up that story. Barry Sheen said to me the other night, he said, uh, you're going to talk to Crosby. He said, he cost me a world championship. Oh, mate. Is he still going on about that? I can't believe that. There's only one person to ask, and that's me, because I saw it, because I was sliding down the road on me bum, looking at it. I could see Kenny. I could see Marco. Again, the Italian took the wrong view as well. He went the wrong direction. He disappeared off into the track. But, I mean, you know, it's just one of those things. Does it surprise you that somebody with, uh, that, that would make that yeah, I couldn't believe would go it. on to do I so said, well? Barry, what are you doing, mate? This way, this way. And no, went the wrong way. <laughs> oh, boy. I'll bet Al has got a different point of view on that incident. Graham Crosby, one-time racer and good-time bloke. <laughs> you had to have the last laugh. <laughs> uh, Cros, uh, Cros and I had a good laugh together, really a good laugh. And uh, he was a good rider. Um, he was one of the sort of old school and that, and um, we did have, I mean, I did him a favour. I, I told Suzuki's I didn't want to ride from him anymore. He got himself into a nice ride. Yeah. <laughs> nice ending to that piece. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> okay, let's go back to live pictures now here in Shah Alam. As you can see, the grid has reformed. Well, Barry, I noticed a rack of tyres out there. There's a number of uh, intermediate cuts. There was even a couple of slicks I saw in the selection there. This track will dry quickly. Yeah. Because uh, you can see now the rain has stopped, so the heat in the circuit it will dry it quick. Oh, yeah, really quickly. I'm just trying to um, get a look, see what tyres rain has got on. You may get that look now. There we go. Yeah, that's an intermediate. That means that it's not got very deep cuts in it. Um, it's not like a rain tyre. Yeah, that's the one he's going to run with because they're doing up the brake calipers now and the forks. It's, it's not a heavily cut tyre. Um, so the reason they have the, um, the grooves in it, in case there's any sort of maybe a possibility of puddles or whatever, it clears the water. But more especially, those, those uh, grooves in the tyre allows the rubber to move and wa warm the uh, tyre up so it builds its temperature up. But when, when you look at that, Barry, sorry, but there's a wet race sign up. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, it means it's wet. <laughs> I understand. No, 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 there's, there's a special yeah. definition no. of it. It's, it's a wet race. It's being designated as a wet race, so you can put in that's uh, um, Creville's bike. That's got an intermediate in the front. It's designated as a wet race. If you want to put slicks on it, whatever you like, yeah. you can put on it. But they are not going to stop the race again because of because of the weather. So what if it happens now? Yeah. Finish it out. If you want to go out, if you want to put slicks on it, you can put slicks on it. But all that's telling you is we're not going to go through the absolute stupidity yeah. of starting, stopping, starting, stopping. You make your mind up now, chaps, because whatever pull over your neck, you end up wearing it. Let's have a look at the positions of how they stood 
of course, before the race was stop of the rain. It was Michael Doohan, Rainey, Creville, Mackenzie, Chandler and Beattie. They were the positions. Now, they have 18 laps to complete. So this race, although it's been run in two sections, it really is classified still as the one championship race now. Yes, it is. Um, I see there Chandler came up and got in front of Darrell. That's a really good, um, good ride from Chandler because the bike, as I was saying earlier on, is certainly not uh, the hot tip. But these kind of conditions maybe will help Chandra a little bit. One little thing, let's say the track starts to dry, and I, I'm, the only example I can give our viewers of recent times here was the IndyCar race, which I know four wheels against two, but the, the situation was much the same. How long does an intermediate tyre last once the track starts to dry and there's no water left? Um, not too bad on the front. On the back, is, um, that's where you really have the problems because this, the second the tyre, the second the circuit starts to dry, your tyre is getting good dry traction and it's just tearing, you know, where you've got the grooves to make the rubber move to heat the tyre up. It's just heating it up a lot more than it actually wants to be heated up. So then it starts to shred it. But, um... 18 laps? Mm, 18 laps and intermediate should, um, should go the distance. But having said that, I don't know what kind of rubber there, what kind of compound, etc., etc. And um, if you see, we won't be able to tell until we see just how wet the circuit is and just how long it stays wet. But the ground temperature, bear in mind, is pretty high, so therefore it's going to dry up pretty quickly. I'd just be really interested to know if anybody's taken a punt and put a slick on the back. So the 30 second sign is up for all to see and we'll have a start again and conditions here have really changed dramatically in that uh, 35 minutes since that race pulled up because it was absolutely bucking down. Randy Mamala was outside the uh, garage cooling down in torrential rain and as you can see now there's there appears to be little water laying around. The track workers have done a great job they were brushing all the corners to make sure they could get as much water off as they possibly could. So the riders now are going round on a warm-up lap and you can see the water on the ground coming away from the tyres, but see, there's not a lot there, Barry. No, it's, um, it's typical Malaysian weather. I mean, it does this, you know, out of six days, four days it will do this. And if you give it uh, an hour, it won't even look as if it's been raining there. It's um, just something that happens virtually on a daily basis. But it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see any surface you see there there's brown on the right hand side of the circuit that shows that that part of the actual ash belt is dry so if you give it probably six or seven laps you're obviously going to have the the little sort of pools of water across or little semi rivers across the side that's Ch chandler making a last minute uh, a last minute wise guy decision and uh i would have to say that uh that wasn't the best idea because it's really going to leave him stuck for time to get back uh, to get back to find out what's going on. Well, you can see the spray coming up now as the uh, the bikes make their way around, but the racing line will dry pretty quickly. Oh yeah, the racing line will dry quick. I'd be really interested to know what they're putting on uh, Chandler's bike. I can't imagine they put a slick in the front. They had the front. Uh, they were fiddling with the front end of it, and uh, to put a slick in the front. Oh. That's so it. Chandler's really got to play yeah, some catch-up. Chandler, no? Chandler ain't going anywhere. Chandler's going back in the pits. They waved him off, or...? No, I don't think so. I think you'll Probably. find that they just simply uh, run out of time. So, a costly mistake, perhaps, there for Chandler as they come round now to form up. And that's a shame, because we know how well he can go in the wet. Well, now he's away again. I'm not quite sure he's, what's going on. He's going to start from the pit lane. Uh-huh. Right? As far as, as far as I could imagine, he would be starting from the pit lane. Um, foolish thing to do, to try and be... In a situation like this, you don't want to try and be clever. You want to copy what the, the, the top six guys have got on, because uh, um, it can go horribly wrong, um, as it has done. And so what you, what you should do in a situation like this is just copy the top guys, because they're the only ones you're worried about. So as the field now completing their grid up, you can see the red flag holding up. Mick Dillon on the right-hand side of your screen. Daryl Beattie is tucked in behind him on bike 58. Wayne Rainey is on one. Then Cravilla was going so well, sitting next to him. Barros oh, on bike six, and look at the start. Gee whiz, Mick Dillon didn't get a good start. Back into Mick's bike, it spun on the uh, white line and just sort of fishtailed. The back end came right round. 
and uh, that's done him no favours at all. What you do, you try, and that's Barros uh, leading there. Uh, what you, the uh, Dunlop tyres were supposed to be good in the rain, but they certainly were good in the rain. Uh, but uh, there again at Suzuka, they certainly didn't show up too good. Gariga sitting in second place on bike number six. The only two people with Dunlop tyres are a mick up into fourth now, so he's smoked it in uh, just half a lap. Oh, his heart must have went into his mouth. He just couldn't get traction. Yeah, it's, you see now, this is how, how much um, difference tyres can make because those two guys that were really not in the hunt in the dry on the uh, Dunlop tyres in the rain all of a sudden are up there. Now, this is a hard task for Mickey. He was leading and leading reasonably comfortably. He, he kept increasing the lead he had over Wayne Rainey. He can't afford to panic now in the early laps here. No, he won't. He'll just suss out what's going on. But uh, he's uh, two or three places in front of Rainey. This is where you have to really watch the back end of the bikes just until the tyres get a little bit warm. And even when they get warm, you can get halfway around the corner, getting good traction, and then you run over a, a patch that's even damper. It's Creville in third place. A long time since Kajiva have led. Yeah, you say that again. It's, well, it's nice, you know, if they could get a good result, it'll uh, sort of fire their enthusiasm, enthusiasm up a bit because uh, they, um, as of the last sort of two races, they haven't been uh, very pleased with the results. So it's Barris, Gariga, Creville, Doing now coming up on the outside of Greville. Barris looks to set to make a move on, uh, on or Gariga makes a move on Barris. Yeah, you see see the um, the dark black of the tarmac and then you see the light patches. That's just where it's drying. And you'll notice after six or seven laps, see how much it's dried there. Um, you would have to say that if you were brave enough, you could have bolted a slick in the back but uh, you would have lost so much ground at the beginning that um, looking at that, it doesn't look as if Rainey's having a very easy time. Well, gee whiz, it's amazing how dry this track is in places. As you say, you can actually see the light colour uh, surface there drying right out. There's McKenzie coming through, and yeah. Rainey's a long way Rainey. back. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> He's got to be in eighth or ninth place. So Mick Dewan now, he makes his move on Barris. Comes right up beside him. That's Goddard right up there. The, the last guy of that pack on the white, so Yamaha is Peter Goddard. So Gariga out in front. His heart would be thumping. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, he's, he came on really well last year and um, the Dunlops this year, they, they um, weren't as good as everybody has expected them to be. But I'm sure they've got so much shrapnel in the press that they would have been working very hard. So any kind of luck, they've um, sorted out some decent rubbing. I'll tell you what, he's doing a bit of a runner too, as you, in your vernacular. He, he's, uh, he's opened up quite a gap. Yeah, it really is. But um, Mick will just settle down and uh, it, it's, there's no sense in going all out, you know, and getting all excited at the moment because he's got everything to lose, Mick. See Creville still up there, and that's Peter Goddard in fourth place. So Rainey is uh, certainly not um, liking the conditions too too much. These kind of conditions are the worst, the pits, because um, you see how much that corner's dried in one lap. What a great run from Goddard. Oh, yeah, well, he's, he's, he has been going well. He's raced in Malaysia quite a few times, so he knows the circuit really well. You see how careful you have to be when you're changing direction and get in on the power because as I said when you, you come out you think oh it's nice and dry just as you're really getting the hammer down then you run into some rain or a damp patch again and it can really catch you out. Now Barry on these tyres is it sensible now to be running into the wet parts of the circuit as much as you can? It really depends on what they've got on I'm sure you'll find that they'll all have intermediates on uh, so at this stage of the game no, I wouldn't think so. You know, I'd be more more intent on going as quick as I could go without sort of going all over the circuit just to try and make cool my tyres down. And um, you, lo you lose so much time by trying to be clever sometimes, so you might just as well end up wearing it and do what you would do normally. So Gariga out in front now from Mick Doohan. Doohan probably close that gap a little on that half of the, uh, the circuit. Gariga just made a bolt of a start. The Dunlop's obviously working pretty well there. Yeah, working well, plus the fact uh, Gariga, um, because he got a good start, got the bit between his teeth, and uh, 
that I'd have a little go at Creville. This is, you see there when they're changing, um, changing from dry to wet, dry to wet. But that's really difficult because you come up to a corner, you've got, you get hard on the brakes so the front wheels virtually lock in when it's it's really sticking to the tarmac then all of a sudden you get a nice wet bit and then the front wheel locks then so you have to be really really careful in this kind of conditions rainy in behind peter goddard and it's great to get him some television time too because so much was said about daryl beady and mick doon and wayne gardner but goddard's almost a forgotten face of the australian contingent oh i wouldn't say that you know he's um really you know you, you have to we talk about mick and talk about uh uh, Daryl Beatty because they were right up there you know you can't he is up there now so we can't talk about him so Gariga tiptoeing around he's he really is trying to just keep it all together out in front he knows that doing is closing he's pitted be telling him that but gee it must be so hard Barry to ride in front of you to, to try and I mean oil you can see but uh, this water it's sort of in patches everywhere isn't it yeah it's just I can't I really can't explain to you how how iffy it is because uh, you can be doing nothing uh, wrong everything right and then just run over a damp patch we're only talking about a little patch sort of two inches wide or whatever and it can ruin your whole day so they're the positions after 19 laps that's obviously on the adjusted board yeah they're, what they'll do they'll add up the um the position finishing positions in um in this race together with the other one and uh oh, could be having a go there you see that is really taking your life in your hands where we go go on um what i was talking about the dry damp dry damp thing if you're trying to outbreak someone you're concentrating on what you're doing to outbreak them and you have to take into account the changes look at the track now it's almost dry on that point look at daryl b but rainy there has picked up both Breville and goddard so he's on the charge now Beat is um, going really well because he's caught this pack up quite easily and uh, just sort of settling down. So I wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, Dazzle get past this lot. Good battle back in this pack. You've got Rainey and then Creville, then Goddard, then McKenzie. Then Beatty. This yeah. section of the circuit a little wetter. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's horrible. The, the only th the only thing about it is once you've done six or seven laps, you know where the damp parts are. So the really damp and wet parts. So you're not going to come round and all of a sudden the place that was dry end up being damp. So things can only get better for you once you've made sort of four or five laps in these kind of conditions. You've you've got it pretty well sussed as to uh, what's going to catch you out. But hats off to Bernie Eccleston because if time's gone past, that would have been all washed out. We'd have still been sitting here now saying, for God's sake, start the race, and it would have been decision in decision. They get out on the grid, then somebody would throw a wobbler and say, no, let's wait another five minutes, and that's um, what I said right from the word go with Bernie. He's just so good and gets everything. He knows the problems people are going to come up against, and he raises them before uh, before they even exist. So Mick Doohan, of course, leading on the adjusted point score, running second on the road at the moment behind Goriga. Yeah, looking at Mick's bike, he's definitely got an intermediate on the back and on the front. See, with intermediate tyres, what they are is a slick tyre, like as you would race within the dry, and you can make your own selection of grooves around it. You know, you can put, uh, say, three or four grooves right the way around the tyre, a few grooves off to the side. You can make make your own mind up. With it. You were telling me a very interesting story. You were telling me about a tyre that you were actually hand-cut for your own use that was used uh, by, the, by the factory. Yeah, well, still now, to this day, Michelin's, uh, the uh, rain tyre, Michelin rain tyre, is still the tyre that I hand-cut 15 years ago. And the, the big boss of Michelin's was in Japan and we were laughing about it. Because when I raced for Michelin's, they didn't have a good rain tyre. I got them into 500 Grand Prix. And um, I did a lot of testing and cut my own tyres and said, right, make me some of these. And uh, they're still working. When you think of technology, Barry, in 15 years, it was, <laughs> it was a good cut first up. Well, yeah, the, the pattern of the tyre hasn't changed but the technology as far as radial tires it's been fantastic what they've done you see how much traction mick's getting now you know he wouldn't get any wheel spin now because the tires warm and even where the circuit is damp 
I say damp, you know, where the, the, the dark patches are, you could still lift, lift the wheel quite easily. To use the terminology of Wayne Gardner, Mick Doohan's riding smart these days. Oh, yeah, he is, no doubt about that. He's, uh, I think the best thing ever happened to Mick was his first year in Grand Prix. You know, he realised he couldn't, couldn't win the World Championship in the first two races sort of thing. And it's uh, made him really wise, really think as far as the only way to get points are to finish the race, etc., etc. And, uh, you know, it's something that everybody ends up learning a lesson sometime. So, Gariga on the Yamaha, really making a fist of this. Out in front, he'd be loving every second of it. He'd know exactly where Mick Doohan is. Can he hang on? The, the carrot for Mick is the fact that so the difference in points between first and second now is five. So if you stack up the old wins, it doesn't half give you a big lead. And don't forget, Schwantz, Schwantz or Chandler are second and third in the championship. Neither of those are riding. Well, I think Chandler probably did get away, but he's not, uh, he's not centre stage at the moment, if, if indeed he did actually start. Looking at the world champion, Wayne Rainey, and he has his luck soured. He went for so long without putting the bike down, and then in, in three races, down he went, and, uh, of course, suffering a, a hand injury, a leg injury, and uh, really has been uh, pushing it so hard ever since. Well, that's it. You know, it's all the years of racing. You know, your, your luck does go in cycles. You just look what's happening to Senna at the moment. You know, couldn't do anything wrong, and the same with Rainey. It's, um, but you can't moan if you get the good luck which uh, Wayne has had, and a fair share of good and bad luck, nice balance, then uh, Chandler's in sixth place. So that's a good ride from Chandler. Oh, a good ride from Chandler, considering he didn't get a warming up lap and he started from the pit lane. And he's got past Beatty too. Yeah. So this is lap eight of the 18 laps that were rescheduled after the rain. Gariga and the Yamaha still hanging on. Mick Dillon on the Honda in behind him. We'll take a break, come back. Stay with us. This is a gripper. Just a few seconds ago, Michael Dillon from Australia blasted past Gariga in this move to take the lead. Ten laps to go in this, the second stanza of this race that was hollered by rain. Back live now, you're looking at Wayne Rainey chasing uh, Doohan, who is way out in front at the moment. Gee, that was a good move from me. Yeah, great. You know, he just put the old pressure on and in uh, two laps, you know, just caught an enormous amount. So uh, he's ridden he's ridden a really good race because he's just sussed out how the bike was feeling. See how far Rainey is behind. Yeah, Rainey is uh, hauling um, Gariga in now. So we, it's, you see Rainey just coming to the shot at the top now. So, whoa, look at the back end of Mick's bike. That's um, getting hard on the brakes and uh, the back end getting light and you're getting hard on the back brake as well and changing down at the same time. So that tends to lock the wheel up a little bit. So that's that sort of skittery look you get on the back end of it. Just reminding you right around Australia that Sports Sunday, Australia's top rating program, Ken Sutcliffe, Tony Gregg, will presenting some uh, fabulous stories for you there. Right around Australia up till news time following this race. You're looking at Mick Dillon now out in front of the Malaysian 500cc Grand Prix. If he can hold this together, it'll be three wins from three starts. Yeah, it's st still the conditions are, are still, even though it has sort of dried out, you see all those patches, they can catch you out so easily. I can't tell you, I can't, can't tell you how nasty it is. You know, you can just go into a corner and everything could be going perfectly. You get on the power a little bit and it's all over with so you have to be so careful and look when you're riding in conditions like this you're not looking down the track you're looking virtually 10 feet in front of you you know to look at the circuit pretty graphic back further where you start to explain that barry you can see the track totally dry and then you're coming to a wet patch yeah you see now he's on the brakes it's dry 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 and then as he changes direction you see there that little you know that can be a little bit of uh, dampness on lap 12 of 18, Gariga looking for Rainey. Oh, he's going to... Oh, hang on, what's all that about? Oh, it's, oh, it's raining It's again. raining again. Well, Gariga it... was waving him down, saying it's raining again. Well, that's their problem. You know, they had the choice to put wet tyres on or whatever tyres they wanted to. And uh, you can see everybody running, so you can see how quick the rain's coming down. So it will now continue. 
oh yes it will continue and that's why i was saying you nip you pull over you wear it uh, now if anybody had to put rain tires on they would have been totally destroyed by now so you couldn't have been the uh, real sort of weather predictor and taken a punt on the uh, rain tires because it would have just been the, the wrong thing alternatively if you'd have been really the wise guy and put a slick on you we go oh dear me so Gariga very graphically saying it's raining, it's raining as they came across the start-finish line. As Barry's explained, the new rules from Bernie Eccleston, once you make your rubber choice in the rain, you finish. That's it. Well, Gariga obviously doesn't, uh, obviously hasn't read his rule, rules uh, really carefully um, because he can wave and perform and do all he wants to do. Um, as it stands, if you consider the conditions are too bad, you come in. Well, as you can see, it's buckling down again now. Lots and lots of water coming off the rear tyre there of Darrell Beatty's bike. Now, having having run um, quite a few laps in the dry, these sort of grooves in the tyres would have got all woolly. You wouldn't have nice sharp grooves which give you the give you the traction. You'd have the rubber would be sort of uh, torn up a little, and that is horrible in the rain. You'll see the bikes not necessarily sliding all over the place, but moving around a hell of a lot now. Now, Gariga made the bolt when the track was still wet. It'll be interesting to see if he can close the gap on Mick now. Yeah, it's, um, he's, he's obviously clocked that they're not uh, going to stop the race for him or anybody else. So, it, it, as you say, it'll be really interesting to see how much he puts the pressure on now to try and catch Mick. That's... Uh, Rainy just wiping his visor. It's what happens, believe it or not, the rain gets on your visor and you can't, you, you have to wipe it off. You can turn your head sideways, it won't blow the rain off. That's the advantage with wearing those sort of um, rubber gloves because you can wipe your visor and it wipes just like somebody's wiped it with chamois leather. Nasty conditions. So dramatic stuff from Malaysia, looking at Wayne Rainey, the current world champion out of contention so far this year and desperately requiring some points doing everything he can to close the gap on Michael Doohan and there it is splashing his way around now Shades of Japan and Chandler's going to do Mick a favour in a minute because Chandler's catching Rainey gee Chandler's been impressive I mean he's come out of pit lane he's had to chase the pack <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hasn't exactly done it the easy way has he Rainey knows he's there he's had a good good look then now what you have to also take into account is watch where the water's pooling. When I say pooling, where it runs off the edge of the circuit and you always get like a little river in some places. And that is so bad when you come howling into a corner. Let's see, Daryl's coming up. Uh, Daryl Beats is coming up now. He's just got past Creville. So Daryl Beatty adapting to the wet weather conditions. He's got the web feet on and doing well and so is this man out in front. This is Gariga on the Yamaha, bike number six. So quick before in the rain, but we've seen how quick Mick Doohan was in Japan in the rain. So interesting tactics. You can see the pace has slowed right down. Awful conditions. Also steam coming off, off the track. The heat in the road is still there. So we'll take a break, come back with the closing stages of this very, very exciting and interesting day. And there's Peter Goddard off the bike on the side of the road. Well, this race has been called off after 15 laps. Michael Doohan did lead on that final lap. So it's Doohan, Gariga, Rainey, Chandler, Beattie, Creville. Reminding you, Sports Sunday following. But uh, the red flag has gone out, Barry. Yeah, the reason they would have done that, because they consider the conditions were too bad to continue. Uh, there were a couple of accidents. And um, there's, there's no sense. You know, it's a sensible thing to do. The uh, clerk of the course or the starter, Hans Barmer, would have said, right, the conditions are too bad now. And um, they've got people in power that used to race, so they understand it at last. Um, so it was the right thing to do. So the final results for you there. Michael Doohan from Australia winning again. Rainey, Creville, Gariga, Chandler, Beatty, Randy Mabala and uh, Goddard, the top eight for you. And unfortunate that because there are only two or three laps to go. Yeah. But uh, Mick has handled all the conditions today again. Oh, well, you could have had many more different ones, could you? It's, uh, 
No, good, really good ride, good, um, good set up of the bike, good choice of tyres, everything. And uh, more to the point, really kept his head, you know, in very, very difficult conditions. Of course, the next uh, 500cc race is the Spanish Motorcycle Grand Prix. That's live from Jerez. That's Sunday the 10th of May, 10.30pm Eastern Standard Time. But uh, check your local, uh, your local guides for that one. Well, it's been a very interesting afternoon, to put it mildly. I mean, we have had, uh, we've had sunshine, we've had rain bucketing down. Uh, Gariga, big performance from him. Yeah, it was, and I can imagine Gariga feels really sort of cheated now because he was trying to catch Mick again as soon as the rain came down again, but then Mick put the pressure, and I think whatever would have happened, Mick would have won it. OK, well, I hope you've enjoyed this afternoon right around Australia. Of course, we'll be back with the Spanish Grand Prix next time around with the 500s. Right now, stand by for Sports Sunday. Ken Sutcliffe, Tony Gregg, the top-rating sports show in Australia, and they've got some great stories for you. I'll see you next time on behalf of Barry Sheen. Look out for Sports Sunday. This has been another presentation from Nine's Wide World of Sports.